Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's program brought to you by Still Pond and Betterton United Methodist Churches. This is Pastor Bill reminding you that videos of our weekly broadcasts are available on our website, stillbetterchurch.org, where you'll also find our convenient online option for your church offerings. We are grateful for your kind gifts towards the ministries of these two communities. This week, we are resuming our weekly Bible study featuring the television series, The Chosen, Season 2. And we meet every Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Betterton Volunteer Fire Company. And all are welcome to join us. We also hope you'll find time in your schedule to worship with us in our sanctuaries on Sunday mornings as well. Betterton Church service begins at 9 a.m. Still Pond Church begins their service at 10.30 a.m. So please stop by if you can. Let us begin this morning's program with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we recognize your blessings, but we don't always thank you for them. Forgive us, we pray. It's almost as if we expect you to fix everything that goes wrong in our lives. It's easy for us to complain when we think you're not, you don't hear us, and yet how often have you not heard from us thanking you for your kind providence? Lord, we need you for us to survive in this earthly world. We need your son Jesus to give us eternal life. And we need your Holy Spirit to keep us safely on that path of righteousness that leads towards your kingdom. Give us hearts of gratitude, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name who taught us to say when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you all to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Today we're going to read from verses 11 through 19. Again, it's Luke 17 verses 11 through 19, and as you open your Bibles to that page, I want to tell you that in today's reading, we learn that Jesus' miraculous powers extend way beyond his human touch, and it can heal more than just one person at a time, too. So let's read the response of those who had received that healing. Let's begin at verse 11, where Luke says, Now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to the Samaritan, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the lyrics of Fred Pratt Green, let us pray. O Christ, the healer, we come to pray for help to plead for friends. How can we fail to be restored when reached by love that never ends? Amen. You know, back in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Luke, we've read the story of a leper who came to Jesus begging to be healed. And the Lord merely touched the diseased man and he was instantly cleansed. And like today's story, he instructs a man to go show himself to the priest so that he can be declared clean. So that he can return to a normal life in society. A key difference between that story and today's reading is that in today's reading, Jesus performs a miracle from a distance. He doesn't have to touch the ten lepers. He instructs them to go and show themselves to the priest from where he's at. And once again, the healing immediately happens merely by the leper's obedience to Christ's instruction. 
this healing from afar reveals the authority of Jesus' power. In two other instances, Jesus healed someone when they weren't even within his sight. And this should be a reminder for us as we pray to God. We don't have to see God to have our prayers answered. He can see our need, and he can respond to our cry for help from right where he's at. If, that is, we do cry out to him. What's interesting in today's story, though, is that these ten lepers are hanging out together. That was typical in those days. It's like the old saying, misery loves company. During the first century, leprosy was a devastating disease that struck fear in the hearts of people. Those with the disease were isolated, separated from society. In other words, they were outcasts. As today's story opens, Jesus is found walking along the border between Galilee and Samaria. Now, these two peoples, they hated one another. They were really bad neighbors. The only thing that these two nations hated more than each other were lepers. And it really didn't matter what country you came from if you had the disease. Your status in society was immediately lowered because of what appeared to be an incurable skin disease. Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is now curable with the treatment of antibiotics. As a matter of fact, the disease has all but been eliminated in today's world, and scientists have learned a few things about it in the past hundred years. Hansen's disease affects the skin, the eyes, the nose, and the peripheral nerves. Left untreated, the disease can, the, the disease can cripple hands and feet. It can cause paralysis, and it can even lead to blindness. And though the experts can't quite figure out how the disease spreads, they do believe it is contracted by breathing in droplets of the infection as it is coughed or sneezed from a victim's mouth. And this is probably why lepers in the first century had to stay away from the rest of society. The Talmud, or the Jewish oral laws, restricted lepers from approaching normal folks without yelling out, unclean, unclean. And not only that, lepers had to remain a minimum of four cubits, that is to say six feet, away from someone who was not infected. Where have we heard that six-foot rule of social distancing before? <laughs> I mean, isn't that the standard protocol for COVID-19 today? What science has learned more recently is that it would take prolonged close contact with someone having untreated leprosy over several months to actually catch the disease. As a matter of fact, the Center for Disease Control explains that you cannot get leprosy from casual contact with a person who has Hansen's disease simply by shaking hands with them or, or hugging them or, or standing in line next to them or even sitting down to a meal with them. It was seen that folks back in Jesus' time were overreacting to the symptoms. We've seen that before too, haven't we? And it's a good thing that didn't scare Christ away. How else will we know the healing power he possessed and shared so often with the disadvantaged people in society? It makes sense that Jesus is found walking along the border of these two nations. He goes to the margins of society to heal those who have been marginalized. <clears throat> Jesus did not do an inventory of these ten lepers' heritage when they cried out to him. He knew they were lepers. He knew everyone considered them the dregs of society. His miracles show no discrimination among mankind. <clears throat> but when these men cry out to him, they're asking that Jesus have pity on them. They're asking for food or clothing or money so that they can survive. You see... A leper could not own any livestock because no one would buy from them. They could not perform any public service like carpentry or blacksmithing for their fellow man would, would fear spreading the disease by close contact. When they asked Jesus for pity, they were probably begging for food and money. They weren't expecting what Christ was about to give them. Jesus instructs the men to go show themselves to the priests. And this was a mosaic law that prevented unclean individuals from returning to society prematurely. You had to be inspected by the priests. They were the experts. And whatever they say goes. 
You were at their mercy. So we need to give these ten men some credit. They were obedient to Christ's commandment, though they probably grumbled. They were most likely disappointed by not receiving money or food, but they risked embarrassment at the hands of the priests by going to them anyway. You see, if Jesus, the miracle worker, says go, then they should go, and so should we. It's in their obedience that they are cured, and they are healed along the way. The ugly skin lesions and boils were disappearing right before their eyes. They saw the healing happening in each other, and by then, they were probably thrilled to go to the priest. But one guy doesn't follow the same path as the other nine. He turns back to the one who caused the healing. He praises God and prostrates himself at Jesus' feet, thanking him. And as much as we'd like to point out the, the failure of nine men who forgot to thank God for the blessing, we might want to take a hard look at our own practice of thanksgiving. Too often, we take advantage of the simple blessings in our own lives. Sure, we might readily thank the Lord for getting us out of a jam, but how about the little things in life that happen on a daily basis? Do we take them for granted? Of course we do. It's only when we don't have something that we realize how much we needed it in the first place. Imagine, for instance, if the sun did not rise in the sky this morning, that there was no dawn, and at 9 o'clock it was still dark. Even at noontime it was black as midnight. There were no birds singing, only the hooting of an owl still thinking it's night. And then comes the long after out, afternoon hours of still no sunlight. And when, the sun was, and when the sun was supposed to be setting in the evening, it was only continued darkness. Everyone getting ready for bed would probably have a hard time sleeping, wondering if the sun would be there in the morning. And people would probably be in the churches, praying on their knees. The night would be filled with terror and agony. Fear would set in to the multitudes. What if it's still dark by morning? And suddenly, that big red ball appears over the eastern horizon the very next day. The soon fearful and tear-streaked faces turn to joy with the rising of the sun. I imagine the world would be shouting, Praise the Lord! The sun has risen today! How our emotions would suddenly change. Michael Adams said that it's impossible to be anxious and thankful at the same time. And someone else wrote that the very consistency of God's blessing sometimes seems to dull our senses, even our gratitude. The wonderful thing about the mercies of God is that they are fresh every morning and new every evening. We should constantly thank the Lord, just as he has constantly blessed us with new mercies, new miracles each and every day. Sadly, though, we fall into that 10% reality of Luke's story today. Ten lepers were healed. Only one returned to say thank you. In today's financial world, a 10% return on one's investment might seem to be profitable, but what did the other nine men in today's story lose when they didn't return to Jesus? They lost a chance for salvation. All ten men who were healed can now return to society, but the one who returned to Jesus receives an even greater blessing. He can now return to God. In verse 19, Jesus tells the man to rise and go. Your faith has made you well. And the Greek word for made well is sozo, which literally means to be saved, to be delivered from physical death into everlasting life. Jesus gives healing to all who cry out to him, but he gives salvation to all who come to him. The leper's healing came through obedience. Sure, with their physical healing, they could return to a viable human existence, but salvation came through gratitude and faith. And only one out of ten realized the greater gift of eternal life. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, 
and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. One out of ten lepers coming to Jesus seems to prove the arithmetic in Christ's statement. Friends, you know, as sinners, we are all outcasts. Maybe not from today's society, but we are definitely outcasts from heaven. It's only through the saving grace of Jesus Christ that we can even make our approach to the kingdom of God. Jesus answers the cry for human healing, but he gives wholeness to our souls when we come to Christ in faith and gratitude. Mita Stamper once said, Love that springs from gratitude is the essence of faith. And Dr. Ralph Wilson notes that faith is exhibited in what we actually do, not just what we want. All ten lepers asked for pity, for money, clothing, or food, and Jesus gave them something unexpected. He gave them human healing from their disease. But the one who returned to praise God and, and fall at Jesus' feet gained the greater gift of eternal life, even though he was an outcast, a Samaritan, an undeserving sinner. Are we thankful for God's blessing? Are we prepared to come to Jesus? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we don't deserve it, through Christ crucified you healed us of the human disease of sin. We thank you for this great sacrifice and for the gift of faith that comes with believing that Jesus is our only way into your presence. Forgive us when we forget to be grateful and kindle in us the fire of constant thanksgiving for all that you provide along the way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's closing thought from the book Springs in the Valley comes a story of a man who found a barn where Satan kept his seeds ready to be sown into the human heart. And what the man discovered was that the seeds of discouragement were more numerous than any other seeds stored in the barn. And he learned that they could be made to grow just about anywhere. But when the man questioned Satan, he reluctantly admitted that there was one place in which he could never get the seeds of discouragement to thrive. And the man asked, and where's that? To which Satan responded, in the heart of a grateful person. You know, with practice, gratitude can come easy even to those who are commonly vulnerable to discouragement. Maybe the best way to be thankful to God is to make a list of 10 simple things that are pleasing to your five human senses. Things like the sound of walking through scrunching leaves in the autumn, the warmth of a fireplace on a cold evening, the view of the stars on a clear winter's night, the smell of bread baking in the oven, and the taste of pumpkin pie. Our thanks should not only be for God's providence of these great gifts, we should be grateful that we can experience them in our human condition. The devil will try to distract our attention from godly things. He will discourage us from the glory that surrounds creation. He will numb our senses, and our discouragement can easily turn into anxiety. The Apostle Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything be by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I know that Thanksgiving Day is more than a week away, but our praise and thankfulness to God is not just restricted to one day a year. Real gratitude doesn't have a calendar. And maybe, just maybe, we can practice thanking the Lord by expressing our gratitude towards one another. Remember that God bless you with friends and family. If for nothing else, be thankful for that. We hope you can join us for worship in our sanctuary real soon, but if you can't, that's okay. You can always tune in next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for another broadcast. And until then, go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen.